The Great Depression started in 1929 and lasted 10 years. Lawrence Griffin, born in 1922, was a boy during these hard times. He and his father lived as servants on the Brandegee Estate in Jamaica Plain. Both gardened, shined shoes, and performed a variety of other tasks as well. My grandpa said he hated it there because when they wanted him, they would call him James, a stereotypical name for a servant back then. Larry's life on the estate was lonely and filled with violence. His father was a violent alcoholic and barely spoke except in anger. Larry was 17 at the time when his father died of liver cancer around the age of 52. The Brandegee family was kind to his family after his father died and let them take their time finding a new place to live and a way to survive. Because of the war and new job openings, his mother found a job in South Boston in a factory. Beyond Larry's life, substantial events were taking place outside of the U.S. The fascists were on the rise in Europe and Asia. Hitler's army conquered Rhineland, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. The Japanese fascists, under the rule of Hidaki Toho and Emperor Hirohito, conquered much of Southeast Asia. In 1940, Larry enlisted into the Navy. He was rejected on medical grounds because he had a deviated septum, which caused very bad sinus problems. He then tried to enlist in the Army and was rejected for the same reason. His mother decided to work overtime to save enough money so she could pay to correct his deviated septum. After the surgery, Larry went for his third physical. This time, the Army doctor was about to reject him, but instead felt sorry for him and let him in the Army. Soon after he enlisted, he was off to South Texas for basic training. He said the food there was good and abundant, much more than he was used to. So despite a great deal of physical exertion, he gained 30 pounds. He also told about one of the soldiers who died during a physical training exercise. This helped him finally realize that this was something serious. While Larry was readying himself for a life as a soldier, on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, forever altering millions of lives, including his own. After basic training, Larry had one chance to say goodbye to his mother before he was deployed. He left for Europe on a big transport ship that sailed out of New York Harbor. All of his friends were above decks, excited, admiring the beautiful view. They yelled to him, Griff, Griff, it's the Statue of Liberty, but he would not come above decks. He was scared to death. Once arriving in Europe, Larry's unit stationed in England, where most American troops were prior to D-Day. Before the Battle of the Beaches, soldiers started receiving mass amounts of free cigarettes and an abundance of food. My grandpa said he knew something big was about to happen. On the morning of June 5, 1944, U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe, gave the okay for the D-Day invasion. On his orders, 6,000 landing craft, ships, and other vessels carrying 176,000 troops began to leave England for the trip to France. That night, 822 aircraft filled with parachutes headed for drop zones in Normandy. An additional 13,000 aircraft were mobilized to provide air cover and support for the invasion. June 6, 1944, 160,000 Allied troops landed along a 50-mile stretch of heavily fortified French coastline to fight Nazi Germany on the beaches of Normandy, France. More than 5,000 ships and 13,000 aircraft supported the D-Day invasion, and by day's end, on June 6, the Allies gained a foothold in Normandy. The D-Day cost was high. More than 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed or wounded, but more than 100,000 soldiers began to march across Europe to defeat Hitler. By day's end, 155,000 Allied troops, Americans, British, and Canadians, had successfully stormed Normandy's beaches. Larry's unit was a part of the fake D-Day invasion that the Allies put together to fool the Germans. He and all the troops in his unit thought that they were going to fight in the first wave of troops when the invasion began. As it turned out, having participated in the fake invasion, he was about two weeks behind the first wave that landed on D-Day. There was also a huge storm that prevented reinforcements from being sent in. Despite Larry's luck, the responsibilities of his unit were to collect the dead bodies after the battle. December 16, 1944, American troops had freed most of France, but Hitler's troops were not done yet. Germany's goal for this operation was to split the British and American Allied line in half, capturing Antwerp, Belgium, and then to proceed in destroying four Allied armies. If accomplished, Hitler would then fully concentrate on Eastern Europe. Finally, after much anticipation, the American Air Force attacked. 
In the wake of the defeat, many experienced German units were left severely depleted of men and equipment as survivors retreated. For the Americans, with about 500,000 to 840,000 men committed, and some 70,000 to 89,000 casualties, including 19,000 killed, the Battle of the Bulge was the largest and bloodiest battle that they fought in World War II. When Larry got back to his unit, people he'd been close to were dead and wounded. While the battle was still going on, Larry had been at Army Headquarters, where the General was, working a 9-to-5 job, as he put it. There was a golf course, a country club, though Larry didn't play. Again, Larry faced immense amounts of survivor guilt. When the battle ended, Larry was sent to Rheims in France. The army was being reorganized in preparation for the invasion of Japan. Units that had suffered a lot of casualties were being reconstituted, and Larry said that he was being rotated into a combat engineers group that had been among the first ashore on D-Day. When the atomic bombs had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Larry didn't think anything of it. He was just glad that the war was over. I think in later years, he felt ashamed of being so happy. When Larry got home from the war, his mother was really sick, but she lived another two or three years. His brother Jimmy was even more traumatized by the war than Larry was because he had been on a ship which was attacked by a kamikaze and suffered many casualties and a lot of damage. Despite the family's tragedy, Larry enrolled into Boston College on the GI Bill. He majored in psychology because he wanted to understand some of the behavior he had observed during the war. During college, Larry got a job working at the Railway Express, the 1940s equivalent to UPS. He loaded packages to ship out by train from South Station in Boston. His mother died shortly after enrolling into college, and Larry was shattered by this news. She died in a janitor's storage room because she was poor and had no money to pay the hospital. Turns out, Larry never did pay the hospital bill. After much contemplation, Larry decided to enter into a monastery. There, he took a vow of silence, which lasted a year. In the monastery, he contemplated on the tragic events he had experienced during war. His year in the monastery is what my family believes saved him from developing post-traumatic stress disorder. A few years after his time in the monastery, he settled down and married my Grammy. Together they raised seven children in a small town in northern Maine. My grumpy loved to walk in the peaceful woods outside his house. He walked every morning and every evening, no matter what kind of weather it was. He was a quiet man, but he loved his grandchildren very much. 